Welcome to the New Books Network. Good day, everyone. Welcome to the New Books Network. I am your host, Daniel Paris. My guests today are repeat offenders, I'm happy to say. Gary Saul Morrison and Morton Shapiro, both of Northwestern University. A couple of years ago, they came on the show to discuss sense and sensibility, what economics can learn from the humanities. It's a great book, by the way. Uh, Now they are back to discuss their newest collaboration, Minds Wide Shut, How the New Fundamentalisms Divide Us. That book is uh, just out from Princeton University Press. Uh, Saul and Morty, welcome to the show and thank you for coming back. We're delighted to be here. So briefly to set the stage, uh, in the first book, you argued forcefully that some of the rougher edges of modern economic thought would would benefit from the understanding of human behavior that is on display in the humanities. Thank you very much. And especially so in, say, the great realist novels of the 19th century. That was a fascinating uh, effort and and I think very successful. But now uh, you're really going on big game hunting. You're taking on some much, I would say, even more challenging issues. Would one of you like to take it from here, the expansion of the of the target zone, as it were? Well, Daniel, this is Morty. So let me just say a few words and turn it over to Saul. First of all, thank you for inviting us back. We had a great time a couple of years ago. We were afraid you had forgotten about us, but then you invited us back. So we feel like we've really arrived. Um, this book, you know, if you read some of the reviews in the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere, they've come out pretty quickly over the last two weeks. A few of them said this is sort of a continuation, Daniel, of our earlier effort, uh, Sense and Sensibility. And, you know, it is true that the idea of dialogue was big in that one and this one. But I think you're right. This is so much more broader and and, and the critique is so much more, I think, heart felt, but also sort of critical of the way the world is going than the first one. The first one was pretty tough on economists, as I heard from my economics colleagues. This one talks about religion and it talks about the humanities and the social sciences and the sciences and politics. And, um, you know, we didn't make any more friends on this one than we did on the last one. So I think it's some ways a continuation because it is about meaningful dialogue. But as you pointed out, Daniel, it's a much broader subject than the earlier one. So, uh, Saul, I don't know if you wanted to add to that or or, uh, to kind of just dive right into it. Yeah, the the dialogue part, uh, what they have in common is if you take, in the first case, it was take two disciplines, the study of literature and economics, and look at them as not just different subject matter, but different ways of looking at the world, different sets of questions, different standards of evidence ways of thinking about people, and then let each one see itself in the eyes of the other. And you learn that way. That, that's what a real dialogue is. You look at yourself as the other might see you, and you learn from the other point of view. Now that's ideas. We think that idea is really necessary um, for progress in lots of disciplines, and also just to make democracy work when people just don't listen, when they just won't refuse to engage in dialogue, just shouting. Um, when People don't have a right to others' opinion. When you're sure you don't have an opinion but the truth, democracy uh, suffers. It depends on that kind of uh, dialogue and respectful exchange. So, you know, the the timing of your book, the country's very divided. We just spent uh, four years of extreme division. It was bearing uh, more than perhaps should be bared. And in that period, both intellectually and and just uh, out in in the the public's uh, forum, uh, the terms fundamentalism uh, were being thrown around all too casually. One of the important, I think, contributions of the book for uh, readers today is uh, you do spend time at the beginning go over, going over definitional issues, clarifying the meanings here, because it is it is too easy. And you also have the history of, def- of fundamentalism, which started as a narrow, a narrow term and now has become way too broad. But uh, that was fascinating and, and new to me. But I think it's important when, uh, as part of the very point that you're making, people are using these terms with their own meaning, and it makes it very hard to have meaningful dialogue when we we are uh, using, uh, say, that term, uh, fundamentalism, in in a way that the other person on the other end is not. Well, Daniel, let let me say a few words. And since Saul wrote that wonderful section about this is how we define fundamentalism, and he wrote that section about you just referred to about how it's changed over time from, you know, it's been around for a hundred years, 
for now, and, and Saul can talk a little bit about how it's evolved. But as you just alluded to, um, calling someone a fundamentalist means that you're you know, anti-science, that you're stupid, that you're evil, that you don't believe in this dialogue. And, and it's become a catch-all for sort of everything that we don't like. And, and a lot of authors have used, that we saw argued in that chapter so brilliantly, it seems to me, that you know, a lot of authors just use it to, you know, as a label for anything they don't like. And that's just is, you know, to use a word where it's convenient and, and not use it elsewhere, I think, is a mistake. So as you point out in, in the book, I, I, I said to Saul, as I was writing the economics chapter and some other things, I said, Saul, you better really lay this out. And he really immersed himself for many months and looking at the literature. And he came up with a definition of fundamentalism that I think is pretty compelling, right, Saul? Well, what, you know, this is kind of what um, uh, interested me from the time I started doing literature. I, I was going to be a scientist at one point. And what struck me, and then in literature, people were very happy, not just with vague definitions that could be more precise, but with when convenient, picking one definition, and later in the same argument, picking another definition so that it would fit, right? Um, playing literally fast and loose, you know, tight and loose with um, with their terms. And that, I mean, you can't do that in science and mathematics. You have to define them very closely. And that's one thing the humanities could learn from, you know, the more precise um, disciplines. And I didn't want to do that. So I wanted, okay, there are many different ways in which you could depending on what purpose you have, whether you're doing the history of religion or, or something else, that you could say, this is what I mean by fundamentalism. But whatever meaning you pick, you have to stick with it, specify it at the beginning and then stick with it, or your thinking just becomes sloppy. And the, the alternative that you, that you posit and, uh, you know, kind of the con skipping conclusion, though we won't get there yet, is assertion as opposed to the fundamentalist just laying down a diktat and also dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Uh, that, that uh, returned to over and over again as the, I'm not going to say the cure, that suggests an illness, which is perhaps too strongly stated, but the, the, a positive and productive response is dialogue. Uh, and you seem to be getting that and trying to get to that point in each of the, the silos that you, that you address. Well, that's exactly our, our intent, Daniel. And, and, you know, I mean, I, I think it's important to realize, and maybe we'll talk about why do we think fundamentalism has arisen in this horrible way in so many different disparate fields. And then as you just referred to, you know, what do we think is a solution to it? But, you know, to me, you know, recognizing our individual fundamentalisms is really important. And, and I, I think that's something that we had to grapple with as we wrote this book, Daniel, that, you know, you know, I define, Saul so could go back and define all the different characteristics of fundamentalism. For me, the most important one is really that you, if you believe something that is not open to contradiction, you know, um, if, if Karl Popper, the great, obviously, you know, philosopher of science said that everything you come up with should be refutable, right? Should be open to, you know, scrutiny with objective evidence. But there's certain things I know that I, I believe where I'm a fundamentalist. I, there's nothing that's going to convince me certain things. And Saul admitted he has some too. And I think it's okay, Daniel, to have some degree of fundamentalism. Uh, one of the reviewers of the book said, you know, playing on the title, Minds Wide Shut. And she said, you know, you, you don't want your minds wide shut, but you don't want your minds so wide open that your brain falls out. And I think that's a great line, right? So there's certain things that make us who we are. But you don't want most of your beliefs not, you know, to be completely resistant to objective truth. So I, I think understanding our own fundamentalism, I don't know what you would say yours are, Daniel. I'd be kind of curious to turn it around, but there's probably something. I, I know you studied Russian literature. Probably maybe one of your fundamentalist truths for you is that no other literature, French, Italian, whatever, U.S., is as great as Russian literature. And that maybe that's what you believe, and that's okay. But if you believe everything in this fundamentalist way as we define it, you got a problem. Let's, let's address some of the, the silos that you do get to. And again, you, you cannot 
both of you cannot be accused for for lack of uh, going after uh, big prey. The first one is sort of the obvious one that is uh, politics and political fundamentalism. And you do a great job of identifying what we, most of us who watch the news, read the paper, you know, and all too casually use the term political fundamentalist of various stripes around the world, and then trying to, to deconstruct or, or uh, unpack political fa- fundamentalism so that we can get to some sort of dialogue. Do you want to provide some of the kind of the highlights there of that challenge? So why don't you go first? No, you go first on this, <clears throat> this one, Morty. Um, well, you know, I, the, as you know, from being a student of the former Soviet Union, Daniel, revolutions devour their own children, right? Yes, they do. Uh, although, that, of course, that's the French Revolution, too. But, you know, I, I mean, I, I, you know, one of the more amazing and upsetting parts of the insurrection in the Capitol on January 6th, one of the darkest days any of us have ever lived through, was, you know, the far right calling to not just hold Mike Pence, who's a very conservative vice president, as anybody knows, by absolute or historical terms, um, not just hold him accountable, but murder him. I mean, there is one ultra conservative politician, proudly so, but not good enough for the insurrectionists who literally wanted him dead. And then on the, the far left side, you know, I mean, how many people refused to vote for Hillary Clinton and voted for Donald Trump out of some kind of perverse spite because, you know, she wasn't progressive enough or how many progressives have been canceled in the last few years um, because they just don't meet the litmus test of today's progressives. So uh, the revolution devouring its own, I speak, I think speaks to the political world in which we live. Saul? Yeah, I mean, of course, I am also a student of the Soviet Union. And one thing that's clear to me is that if you decide that some groups don't have the right to speak, you, no matter how bad you think those people are, you have to realize that once that principle is established, it will be there forever. And bad people will be using it soon enough, and there'll be no way of protesting because protest won't be allowed. You're, you're opening, you know, you're, no matter how, for some really short term joy of suppressing somebody, you are, you know, you, probably your own head will be on the block just the way, you know, the many of those people in the French Revolution, the Girondists, uh, or, or in the Russian Revolution, you know, Mensheviks and other Bolsheviks got their heads chopped off very, very rapidly. Um, it doesn't stop. You think you can control it, but you will be the victim of it. And there's no turning back. You can't try it. And then that, that's the whole point of a democracy. If something doesn't work, you can be voted out of office. Once you've controlled discourse so that nobody can say anything different, you can't be voted out of office. And it's there forever. And I, I think, uh, uh, Saul, both in our experience and your, my experience and yours, our familiarity with Soviet history it's, it, it makes it all the more frightening because the consequences were so high. You, you devote plenty of space, though one could argue you could devote even more to Arthur Kostler's uh, Darkness at Noon, his kind of evocation of Bukharin's confession to crimes he did not commit, but which he comes to the conclusion logically, the logic of the revolution eating its own children, that he needs to commit to those and suffer the death penalty for it for the greater good of the revolution. And it's, it's a, a, you know, a, a piece of work that students of, of 20th century European history encounter, but it's unfortunately still fresh this uh, today, and, and you guys do a, a very good job in, in bringing that back out, I'm sorry to say. And as you say, you know, it, there's no limit to how bad it can get. You know, in, in the Soviet Union, it led to, you know, gulags with people working at 70 degrees below zero, million, tens of millions of people killing. But no, but there was no way to protest it. There's no way to make it known. Um, and if one thinks that that can't happen here, one is wrong. That once it start, the slide starts, there is no stopping it. Only by so, chance would it be stopped. So you are not the first to advocate dialogue in the face of what's now called political fundamentalism, but has in previous periods just forms of extremism, ideology. I mean, fundamentalism as a, a political term didn't exist in the midst of the 20th century, but in the 20th century... <laughs> Was dominated ideologically by fundamentalists of one stripe or another. On the right and the left in the mid-century, of course. But. Yes. And what 
what gives you any hope that, that you're using the 19th century classics, thank you very much, of realist literature, which is always worth reminding, reminding people about, is going to help further the, the dialogue football? I, I want you to be right. I just don't know whether you will. Well, I, I can say one thing quickly, Dan. You, you mentioned President Trump and how divisive those four years were. And he certainly stirred up a lot of fundamentalist thinking, both from the far right and the far left. And he seemed to enjoy it. Yeah. 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 I think so. Um, but, you know, you know, it is interesting how often President Biden gets attacked. And we, we document this in the book about being a compromiser. Oh, my God, he was friends with John McCain. You know, that kind of thing. And it's just, you know, pretty amazing when you look at successful politicians in the past before the political arena was as polarized as it is now. They took great pride about reaching across the aisle. And, you know, I mean, you go back to, you know, the friendship from George McGovern and and Barry Goldwater. Talk about strange bedfellows. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them ideologically, but it doesn't hurt to respect them a little bit. And that's what a lot of this book's about. Yeah, and, I, I, you know, extreme, the, the best cure for extremism may end up being extremism, though it comes at a high cost. The pendulum will swing back. I, I, I certainly uh, hope so in order to get things done, which is the kind of the task of the U.S. Senate uh, is compromise, that you have to have compromise. Otherwise, the U.S. Senate is, is kind of uh, pointless. Well, if I could say something about, <clears throat> about that, sometimes I hear from, you know, friends, oh, don't worry about this. The pendulum will swing back. And my answer is, how do you know that the pendulum is the right metaphor? What if it's the snowball going down the hill? It's, you're assuming it's like a pendulum. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the history of movements of this sort does not justify that, you know, assumption. It's the other one that's, that's more likely. It's not wise to comfort yourself with metaphors. Well, uh, if uh, it is comforting, because otherwise it's a frightening prospect, because you don't know where, say, this particular period of fundamentalism will ultimately end. You guys are trying very uh, hard to push towards dialogue. Uh, and again, there are plenty of instances in, in Russian history, right, in 1917, when you have cadets and moderates of various types trying to keep, uh, keep Russia uh, a piece and out of the hands of the Mensheviks or the Bolsheviks or the SRs. And, you know, it gets a lot worse before it gets any better. And uh, that's, that's the tragedy of that history. Let's, let's move on to the second silo, just because there, I think there, are the, you know, you hit the three topics you're not supposed to cover at uh, the dinner table with, uh, with family, politics, economics, and religion. Uh, let's hit the second of the, the untouchable ones. The second is economics. It's fascinating, but uh, you know, maybe it's worth going on describing how it's a little bit different from sense and sensibility. Uh, where you did a, just a great job of enriching the University of Chicago model, your, your, your uh, crosstown rival, as it were, with uh, a little bit more reality uh, of how people actually uh, behave and, and, and uh, can benefit from economic knowledge. How, how does this, this chapter go, go beyond what was in there? Well, I can start it off and then turn it over to Saul. I mean, I, I think when you think about economic fundamentalism, it's the market fundamentalism, this, this overriding belief that markets are the, the way to always to allocate scarce resources, laissez-faire, misreading of Adam Smith, which we started in the first book, and now we go in much more detail in this new book. Um, you know, the icon for laissez-faire, hands-off, you know, limited government is, you know, somebody who never believed that. And if you actually read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, and you particularly read his earlier book on morality from 17 years before that, in 1759, you know that, you know, the, the whole perception of depiction of Adam Smith is not Adam Smith at all. But, you know, the market fundamentalists, you know, just always believe in markets. But now there's an intense market anti or anti-market fundamentalism, which is growing even more. And that's this belief that somehow capitalism is the problem, not the solution. And there's a lot of Things we talk about in detail in that chapter four in the book about, you know, the slowdown and the rate of growth of labor productivity, this enormous increase in income and wealth inequality over the last uh, 40 years or so. Um, but that's not to say there's a better solution than markets for allocating scarce resources. And what the chapter really tries to lay out, Daniel, as you saw, is that, you know, this view that economists don't agree. 
you know, what do you do about climate change? What do you do about health care? What do you do about student loan forgiveness? What do you do about a wealth tax? What do you do about minimum wage and on and on and on is really a, a, a misrepresentation of the economics literature. And we try to present a lot of data that show that economists agree on almost everything. You know, the old joke from Harry Truman, you know, get me a one-armed economist. Why, why President Truman? Because they always say on one arm, on one hand, it's this. On the other hand, it's that. I want some, well, you know, economists really do agree on almost all these key issues. It's just that, you know, the media, I think, misrepresents it. And they always try to say, well, we need more analysis. And stuff. We don't really need more analysis on most of that. And that's what we tried to show um, in chapter four. Saul? Yeah. Um, you know, originally that chapter was supposed to be um, the book. You know, the first book is called Sense, C-E-N-T-S, and Sensibility. And this one uh, was going to be called, what this chapter is called, Price and Prejudice. And it was going to go in the reverse way, what the humanists can learn from the economists. And that's why, you know, a good deal of the chapter is that way. What, you know, why not just have a lot of smart people who know a lot of economics or whatever? Isn't that better organizing the economy than just the chaos of the market? A lot of people think that, and my, my colleagues don't have a, in the humanities don't have a good idea why that's not uh, why that's not a good idea. You so, tell a, it's a very good example from a faculty meeting, which is just worth retelling. I've heard you guys tell that story before, by the way, but it's it's worth retelling about. Uh, allocating resources uh, at a faculty meeting between tenure and non-tenured and uh, refusing to acknowledge the situation. Could you, could you do a summary version of that story that captures this challenge of you're trying to describe so well? Yeah, this is one of those incidents where I thought to myself, I'm not going to forget this. It, it was when I was a department chair at the time and the dean at the time uh, at a meeting of department chairs in the humanities um, asked uh, well, we have only so much money to give for raises. How much should we give to the um, non-tenure track faculty and how much to the tenure track? Because there has been a lot of um, uh, agitation on moral grounds of paying the non-tenure track faculty more. Uh, and this asking the question this way put the chairs in a difficult position because now they would have to say, they have to choose whether they and the people who voted for them would get money or somebody else. And it was, I, I, I was sitting there thinking, gee, I wonder what they're going to say. And there was a long silence. And then finally, somebody um, said, we reject the premise that resources are limited. Yes. Yeah. And of course, no matter yeah. how big the pie, it's limited. You know? yeah. Only a humanist, I think, could come up with something like that, right? But a lot of thinking that you get in, in the public you know, domain um, the, is this would be a good thing to devote resources to without asking, and for going what? What's the cost of doing it this way? Everything that has an advantage has a cost, if only missed opportunities. If anyone who tells you the advantages without specifying the cost and arguing that the advantages outweigh the cost is not being honest. So you've, you, in, the, in the first book, it's the benefit of one to the other. In, in this chapter, the reason people should not skip over it who've read the first book is that it's the benefit of the other to, to the one that is the benefit to the humanities of having at least a little bit of an economic sensibility. Uh, is that a fair summary of that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, I, you know this, these books came out of this course that Morty and I teach, and I have learned so much economics in it. I thought I knew a little bit, but I didn't. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd love to get basic knowledge, um, trade-offs being a key, one of the key concepts, um, more widely situated. There's also a nice little book from Mahir Desai, who you may know of at Harvard Business okay. School, who also does uh, a, a nice a nice effort to try to bring those two together. I think that, it's a very good book. Yeah. And he, he was also a guest on the show. So now we're, we're to the main event. Politics was a, definitely a, a warm-up. Uh, economics may be a... Uh, an entredact, but uh, you do take on in the longest chapter, and I'm going to say the hardest chapter and perhaps the hardest sell, uh, religion and fundamentalism in religion. And people, I think, understand, even political fundamentalists understand that there are other political structures, histories of other political structures, and virtues to other political structures. And I think you can get 
from political fundamentalism to assertion and dialogue easier, maybe easier. Again, last four years has been hard, but easier in politics and, and in economics. But boy, do you have your work cut out for you in the religion, in, in the religion chapter. I, I struggled with, I was kind of rooting for you in the sense of agreeing, yeah, those are good points being made on the politics side and on the economic side. And as I read the religion chapter, which I think everyone should look at really, really closely, it's a, it's a very significant piece of scholarship in trying to do this, it's it's a very hard sell. And I, I'm kind of curious to see what some of the other reviewers or what other feedback you've gotten from taking on what is, you know, in many guises, takes on an, an extreme absolute form. Gee, I don't think of religion as necessarily that way. There is certainly a lot of religion that way. But... Um... You know, I, I also know a lot of theology which acknowledges that we simply do not know a great deal about God or the divine. We're in guessing. This is why we had that section between Luther and Erasmus in the book. That's what yes. Erasmus was very much about. That. And it's a great, great a dialogue. Deal, there's yeah. a great deal of religion that isn't fundamentalist. I think it's a mistake to say, you know, religion is all fundamentalist. I, you know, it's, I think only at the extremes is it, is, is it, is it that way, right? I think... You, Today, it's more likely to go the other way and just say, let's make it mean whatever we like, ourselves in the mirror, you know. Um, Dan, if I can add to that, I, I think that really is the, you know, what Saul just said at the end. It's really important. On one hand, there's, you know, the holy texts uh, written or oral and every religion has them, you know, is the word of the Lord. And, and therefore, there's nothing you can, you're not going to rewrite God, right? On the other hand, uh, many Faiths over the course of the last century, or at least half century, have moved into the relativist camp. I think Daniel, and that, yeah, you know, it is what you, you know, you, you pick and choose, and you know, you take what fits contemporary mores and etc. And what we argue is is closer to the former than the latter. Uh, we argue in the that chapter that you, you want your holy text not to be. In colloquial language, for example, you, you if you never make any changes, then you know that's probably wrong too. So, I mean, it's sort of like the uh, First Amendment, I would say, Daniel. You know, he's just you better have a really good reason to stifle free speech. Well, here I would say, if, if you're going to rewrite the holy text for contemporary standards, you better be think long and hard before you do it. And we have some instances in the book, particularly uh, Leviticus, about the prohibition against homosexuality, why we think that comes from a particular time and place that isn't relevant for today versus other parts of the holy text. Now, neither of us are theologians, Daniel, and to be honest, uh, the very last moment after reading some of the referee reports, we actually, it's already a pretty long, complicated book with 511 footnotes. Uh, and we thought about getting rid of that chapter, and then we decided that we would keep it. But I think you're right. It's going to be the most controversial. I, I, I you know, Saul knows Russian literature. I don't. They're not going to argue all that much about his interpretation. Let's go and Dostoevsky. I'm, I'm a longtime economist. They're not going to, you know, question my analysis of the empirical literature on the minimum wage. But you better believe they're going to challenge every aspect to our religion chapter, Daniel. So yeah. maybe, I don't know. But, you know, I think I don't. So I think you wanted to keep it in. I, I happen to be a person of faith is really near and dear to my heart as an observant too. But, you know, I, I was fine to kick the whole chapter out, chapter five, make the book a little shorter. But Saul was convinced it had, you know, it certainly is. It, it resonates with the other parts of the book in terms of the rise of fundamentalism, what are possible solutions. But it is a field outside of our comfort zone. Du duly noted. But the other point I thought was really fascinating was about the, the point that you make, which I think is worth repeating, is the, the, the da not the danger, but the kind of dilution effect of modernizing religious language, that it loses some of its impact. Do you guys want to summarize that? Because I, th I thought it was a fascinating point and how the King James version of the Bible stands up very, very well against uh, more modern versions as a consequence. Well, this is really not, um, you know, our discovery. We're following here. Um Robert Alter, you know, the great Bible scholar and translator, um, and his book on the King James Bible and the preface to his, you know, translation of, of the Hebrew scriptures, uh, that in fact, he says, 
the King James Bible is actually, despite the fact that they didn't know a lot that we know now uh, from a scholarly point of view, it's still more accurate because they understood the use of words. For example, that, you know, if the original uses the word seed in many ways to mean, you know, semen or generations as well as literal, literal seeds, you keep that, whereas modern versions will just give you the version each time. They, they don't, the modern versions, he said, do not understand how the text works as poetry. That even at its time, it was working with archaic concepts uh, and language. And the eternal needs to speak to you not in the language of today. It needs to speak to you in the language of poetry. It needs to speak to you in the language that is comprehensible, but not colloquial. Daniel, if I can give one quick example. I'm sorry, you know, the, the great line, the verse about beating swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. You know, I guess we could be temp- tempted to say, let's just write, why don't we retrofit tanks into tractors? But that would be an abomination, wouldn't it? Agreed. That's why I thought it was uh, your uh, treatment of the, the poetry of religious texts was, was uh, very powerful and, and contributed to the argument. Thank you. You'll probably be the only one, Daniel. One, yeah, I, I, that, and that's the main part that I, I you know, well, we, we, we'll move on. So let, let's, uh, there was a follow-up chapter even uh, after the kind of uh, very long and detailed account of religion. There's a chapter on literature, which is sort of a little bit circular in a good way because throughout all the chapters and in the prior book, you're using great literature as a basis for people to help understand their world and the meaning in the world and avoid killing each other. And, you know, and it's really rooted in 19th century realism, a lot Russian, but also Western. Uh, one can never have uh, uh, too many reminders of the wonders of Middlemarch, among other things. Uh, and so you have a, a chapter on literature, and I don't know if you want to uh, summarize it, but unfortunately, I summarized it as follows for my notes for this, which was the ruination of great literature. They're messing with some great works, great 19th and 20th century works, and it, I don't know, categorized in a way or put in, a, uh, put in categories and meanings that just can't possibly be attributed to them. They weren't, those were not issues relevant in the 19th century. Uh, applying 21st century issues to, to, to these works is done at great risk, and I, I, I thought it was an important chapter. Yeah, I mean, to do what what you're describing, you have to presume that the interests, values, and perspectives of today are absolutely true and are not going to change, whereas those of any other time are deficient and can be measured against it. You know, whether the different values of 17th century China are just wrong, the different values, if they're not ours, they're wrong. Where do you, since, you know, the people 10 years ago in our culture you're looking down on, you don't figure it's going to happen to you in 10 years? I mean, why do you assume that your values you know, are the eternal values everywhere? Other cultures you know, can go to hell. Other periods can go to hell. That's what this involves. Whereas the whole point of literature is to uh, get yourself to see the world from points of view other than your own, what other human possibilities there are. What other ways of thinking there are, how you might look from the perspective of a well-intentioned person with a different cultural background. That's what literature does. It's the very opposite. And so perhaps the reason that, you know, people you're describing are are doing this to literature is that they intuitively sense that it's the dialogue that it invites is what they don't want. Saul, can we just record what you said and and, uh, pass that? Actually, we just did. Thank you. That was a very (laughs) articulate defense of the role of different perspectives in realism, 19th century literature, and how it can help people live better lives now. The book itself, the entire book, is a romp through a lot of great literature with an emphasis, clear emphasis on 19th century realism and obviously a lot of Russian references. I want to keep the book sort of my my, uh, kind of a bedside reference uh, of what I should be reading uh, next of of the Western classics uh, because you guys do, to your credit, cover uh, a lot of territory and uh, it's worth uh, just keeping handy uh, uh, for for that reason alone. You end with dialogue. Uh, that's where everything is leading up to. Using examples uh, from Anna Karenina, using examples from Middlemarch, using examples th- uh, from, from, the, from the, the Old Testament, where the dialogue just ends with better, better outcomes for everyone involved. My question for you is, you know, the question is with whom, the dialogue with whom. I, I wonder, I'm sorry to say, the people who are going to read this 
the people who have read your reviews in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or wherever they may be on NPR, they're probably already going to agree with you on many, if not most of the issues, and will certainly respect your dialogue as opposed to fundamentalism's absolutes approach. The problem is that the people who won't agree are also probably not listening to this podcast. They're harder to reach. Have you kind of try, thought about that, crossing that divide with this book itself? Well, Daniel, let me take the first shot because one of the reviews said something similar that the people who read it are probably not the people who need to read it. But I, I'm not sure that's true. That's why I said before, recognizing the fundamentalism in each of us is really important. And I think a lot of people who do read books and listen to NPR and these kinds of things need to look themselves in the mirror and say, you know, is it all the people I hate or is it me as well? Um, you know, we grow up differently than, you know, when I was growing up, you know, I, <laughs> there was a common language and it was, you know, Dan Rather or Tom Brokaw or Peter Jennings. And before that, Walter Cronkite and, and, and his peers. And, and, you know, it wasn't that I, I listened to ABC versus CBS or NBC because, you know, I have a political uh, a specific view of the world. You know, they all gave the news, you know, and, and it is true that I used to read Time magazine. I was a little bit more conservative than Newsweek, but it isn't anywhere like it is now where, you know, we're in our silos and, you know, people are watching MSNBC or Fox News or CNN or Breitbart, you know, and, and it's now we're in these echo chambers, Daniel. And I, I think we're all in them. And I think we need to all recognize when we're in echo chambers that it's it's too easy. It's too comforting just to expose our thinking to people who agree with us. And that's for everybody, not just the people who don't read a lot of books. Well, I, I will do my best to get the, the message out uh, across the great divide to the extent that uh, I have people on the other side. I won't say what side I'm on, but uh, uh, I will certainly try. The book is Minds Wide Shut, How the New Fundamentalisms Divide Us. Gary Saul Morrison and Morton Shapiro, thank you so much for being on the show. It's uh, wonderful to have you back and with a, such a, a really stimulating and important uh, work. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having us. You know, Daniel, it's a great pleasure to be back. I, I, I just listened to the uh, podcast you put out from last week with the authors of Financial Bubbles. And Daniel, I was struck how you said that they're going to read that book along with Charles McKay's Madness of Crowds. You think anyone's going to read our book in 20 years? Uh, or 100 years later. Let's say I certainly hope so. I absolutely hope so. I'm rooting for you guys. I will take that. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Take care. Bye.